please welcome Jerry Brito, Coin Center, Marco Santori, Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman, Mark Smith, Symbiant, Rick Geisenberger, Delaware Department of State, and Matthew O'Toole, Potter, Anderson, and Karun. My name is Jerry Brito. I'm an executive director of Coin Center, which is an independent nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., that focuses on the public policy issues affecting cryptocurrencies. And it's my pleasure to have such a great panel uh, here today to discuss uh, Delaware's newly announced uh, blockchain initiative. Uh, we've got Marco Santori, um, who you all know as the blockchain ambassador to Delaware. Uh, we have Mark Smith, CEO of Symbiont. Uh, we have Rick Geisenberg, Delaware Chief uh, Deputy Secretary, Secretary of State, uh, who heads up the uh, Delaware Division of Corporations, and Matthew O'Toole from Potterson, Ander, and Karoon, but he's also chair of the corporate law section of the Delaware State Bar Association. So why don't I begin uh, with Rick and Matthew um, and ask you this. Delaware has a long uh, history of being at the center of corporate law in the United States. Do you want to tell us a bit about that history and how this initiative fits into it? Sure. Well, uh, I mean, Delaware, as the governor noted, was, was not the first state to adopt a corporate law. Actually, the, the first state to adopt a corporate law was uh, New Jersey. Uh, and Delaware copied New Jersey's law <laughs> in, uh, in around 1899 and over time did it better than New Jersey, quite frankly. Uh, and there have been, uh, over, over time, our market share grew and grew until the point now where uh, 66 percent of the Fortune 500, 85 percent of all U.S. IPOs, most venture-backed companies are now incorporated in our state, and there's lots and lots of reasons why that's true. Uh, the first is is our statute, uh, which is generally acknowledged to be the most modern and flexible corporate law in the country. The second component uh, are our courts, which are the most widely respected business courts in the United States. We have a special court called the Court of Chancery that deals exclusively with uh, corporate governance issues, uh, issues involving uh, managers and shareholders. Uh, the third piece is our corporate legal community, which I'll let Matt talk about. And the fourth piece is the, uh, the division of corporations, which has organized its uh, functions around the fact that we have businesses all over the world and all over the country uh, that use our services. And so we were uh, we've been an earlier adopter of new technologies for over 35 years, the first state to have a database, the first state to have imaging, the first state to have workflows, the first state to use the internet, and now uh, hopefully uh, the first state to use blockchain. So I'll let Matt talk about his piece of it, which is the, the corporate legal community in Delaware. There's, there's been a, a public-private partnership that's been in, in place in Delaware <clears throat> excuse me, for about uh, half a century now, where the Bar Association supports our legislature and our governor in maintaining our business organization statutes. It's really been a, a very effective partnership. And, and what we strive for in our, our laws, our corporation laws, our LLC statutes, our, our partnership laws, is, is really to have balance, uh, to respond to the needs of the marketplace, um, and to maintain flexibility so companies can operate in the most uh, efficient way possible. We have uh, a track record to, to allude to Jerry's question about how blockchain fits into this. We do have a track record uh, of responding to technological advances and, and allowing companies to implement those. The governor mentioned in, in his remarks back in the late 90s we had um, uh, amendments to our corporation law to allow for technologies that were emerging at that time, email, the internet, and so forth. Uh, so I think we'll draw on that experience in the context of looking at our, our corporation law now to uh, explore the, uh, the advisability, the, uh, the implementation of distributed ledger shares. So as you're alluding to, there are going to be certain changes perhaps to the corporate law 
that will have to be made to take into account what the governor announced today. What do you expect those changes to be, and how long do you suspect they'll take to? to I would I would hope that um, by this time next year we'll have proposals uh, developed. Uh, I don't want to prejudge where where we'll end up on this, of course, but uh, you know clearly the technology holds the promise for efficiency and certainty and security, uh, and and that's worth pursuing, clearly. Um, we'll take, as the governor mentioned, we take a pretty deliberate approach to these types of initiatives. Uh, there will be a careful, uh, studious approach, but an open-minded approach. Um, and I would expect that that effort will start in earnest, probably in the very near term. We're at the starting line here, not near to the finish line. Uh, but I would expect that by this time next year, we ought to be through that process and have uh, a view on, on what the right approach is. And, and I'll mention, that's the normal cycle of our, our legislature adjourns in June. So uh, we, we start up again as, as soon as they, and, and this year's corporate law package will probably be introduced in the next day or two. Right. Uh, it's very speedy by so, But this days. is very speedy, <laughs> as Marco can attest to. Uh, and, and we are really the only state that takes this approach. I mean, of looking at it every single year, meeting on a very regular basis. Uh, you know, in most states, uh, they might amend their corporate law every five or six years. Uh, we're looking at it every year, and, and I think that's important in this, especially when you're talking about technology, which is, you know, our goal is to have something uh, for this time next year, but we also recognize that there may be developments, things we learn over time, and we may need to revisit, uh, you know, whether additional enabling legislation uh, is necessary, you know, within a year or two later. Okay. I'm going to ask Mark, something the governor announced today is a partnership with Symbion to build a blockchain for Delaware. Can you tell us, give us some more specifics, what exactly are you building and why Symbiont? Why Symbiont, what does Symbiont's blockchain have that others don't? Sure. So first of all, I'd like to thank Ryan and the team at Consensus for allowing us to kick off this very important conference and, and make this what we believe is a historic announcement. <clears throat> uh, we're very fortunate at Symbiont to partner with market leaders uh, in, in all areas where we believe this technology will be valuable and, and obviously partnering with Marco and Pillsbury is an important step to that. Um, I think what makes Symbiont unique and, and, a, and a very good fit for, for Delaware is that we have a very flexible and extensible system. So our platform is really designed around smart contracts and being neutral to the underlying ledger layer. So uh, as everybody here is aware, there are certain use cases where compliance, regulation, privacy requires restriction on those who are on a distributed ledger, where other use cases allow for public ledgers like the Bitcoin blockchain to be utilized. Symbian's unique system allows us to put our smart contracts on any of those. So when you say what's the differentiating characteristic about our blockchain, our ledger, it's not about the ledger layer for us, it's about the intelligence of the smart contract. So with the state of Delaware, we'll explore different types of use cases on different types of ledgers, not precluding the utilization of public ledgers where public documentation, as the governor spoke of, would be appropriate to have on that particular ledger. So what do you think are, like, can you give us one or two use cases that you think might drive efficiencies for Delaware that would, that would make sense that you can envision right now potentially being there? Sure. I, mean, I think the governor had mentioned this, and, and Rick and I have spoke about this uh, at length. So, um, of course, the state of Delaware is the platinum standard for incorporation. And it was that position in the market that drove Marco and I to present this opportunity to the state of Delaware, especially around Article 8 of the UCC, which was mentioned previously. But even more so, um, being able to secure positions on liens with UCC filings are extremely exciting. But internal utilization, mm -hmm. the state has been very forward and, and talk about fast. Uh, when we, we finally made a commitment to this, um, uh, to this project, they proposed some, some potential first use cases. We determined that the archive group is the, is the right place to start due to the nature of pruning the database and those things. And they delivered a, um, a record to us on Monday, and we had it up by Thursday on, on our permissioned ledger as a smart contract. So that's the first step. And then we have a long-term roadmap. Um, we are, you know, we see this as a marathon, not a sprint. So over the course of, of, of many years, our partnership with Delaware will grow, and hopefully we'll be able to deploy this into many internal use cases as well as external facing ones, and maybe come up with some new things that we can do together. Okay. So I want to mention that when we first, yeah. when we first met with Governor Markell to talk about this initiative, uh, it was a three-part initiative, and we got to the end of the meeting with the governor, and the governor said, 
Uh, I, I, it's a really exciting three-part initiative. I want a fourth part. I want the state to jump in. Right. And, you know, we, we only had a few weeks, actually, to work with these folks uh, to figure out what that fourth part was going to be. And, and we came up with, uh, you know, with, uh, initially starting with the, with the public archives. But I think it really demonstrates uh, the governor's commitment to this to say, let's have, you know, let's have the state government start to do this. Uh, and I think there's no better way for us to understand uh, and, and I think it will inform and help the deliberations of the Corporation Law Council uh, in figuring out how do we make this possible for uh, you know, private sector you know, issuers of stock. So uh, lots and lots of opportunity. And as the CEO of the state of Delaware, I can tell you that the governor acted quicker than almost any other CEO <laughs> I've met with or tried to work with. So what you would imagine in that you know, kind of very public area would be slow and, and, and elongated in the process, the governor was very decisive and innovative and we were able to move forward very quickly. That's great. So Marco, let me ask you, you're a newly minted Bitcoin, or I should say not Bitcoin, blockchain ambassador for the state of Delaware. Um, of course, you head up the uh, blockchain practice group at Pillsbury. What does it mean to be now this new role? What, is, what does it mean to be an ambassador? What is it, your role now? Well, you know, as, as I said in, in my introduction, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing much uh, education. I mean, uh, when Delaware came to me, they were way out ahead of this issue. They, they were not the babes in the woods that so many technologists imagine government actors to be. Uh, they had been looking at this for a long time. I think they understood that there were risks and they understood that, the, that there were benefits. Um, but they wanted, to, they wanted to charge ahead and with, with, you know, with an eye on, on, on being careful. And that's something that they've asked me to do um, as, uh, as a conduit for the industry. Um, and so they've, uh, the, the team has asked that um, we try to close the knowledge gap on the, on the issues that are still outstanding and bring to them the ideas and uh, the potential processes and procedures that can really make this, uh, make this a successful program. So um, we'll be... What, what can companies and entrepreneurs in this space, and technologists who are excited by this announcement today, expect? Yeah. Well, I, this is, in my opinion, a significant event in the course of corporate affairs, not just in Delaware, not in the United States, but globally. Um, and I think that this affects public companies. It affects private companies. It affects young companies that are looking to IPO soon. We have a, a one-year-ish time horizon before uh, this, this becomes particularly concrete in the minds of the, of the legislature. And one year is about that time is when you start planning an IPO. Uh, so those who are looking to IPO, this, this is at the forefront of what you should be looking at. Those public companies who are already traded uh, on exchanges, look, your distributed ledger shares are going to be more liquid than other shares. They are, they are going to have a greater um, efficiency of settlement and clearance. This is, this is something that investors want, and this is something that, um, that anyone who's incorporated in Delaware, who's, uh, who's a, an LLC in Delaware, any Delaware entity, and quite frankly, entities who are incorporated in other states, should be looking at Delaware to see, well, this is a real opportunity for us to have shares that can be traded on a blockchain that can be traded quickly. This, as they say, nothing good happens between trade and settlement, right? So it, the closer we can contract that time, the more efficient your transactions and corporate shares are going to be. And that's what, um, that's, that's, that's part of the promise of this today, right? Rick, let me ask you, is, is the Delaware blockchain initiative um, only for private blockchains? What are your thoughts on open uh, blockchains? So. I, I mean, I, I, as, as the governor said, I mean, I think this is, uh, there are opportunities in, in both areas. Obviously, you know, the, uh, when, we're when you're talking about corporate shares, uh, you know, it may, it may depend on whether you're talking about, you know, a, a company in its early stages where it's privately held, where, uh, you know, versus what happens when a company goes public. Uh, I think uh, in the public sector, there are tremendous opportunities potentially for for more open blockchains. I think uh, you, know, you talked about the secure transaction registry, which is obviously a, uh, an open registry. All of the documents in it are, are public record. Delaware, because of a, 
unique provision uh, in the Uniform Commercial Code that requires that secured transactions be registered in the jurisdiction and where the debtor is incorporated. Uh, and that was a provision that changed in 2001, where Delaware perhaps got, I don't know, 2% of the filings nationally, now gets something like 10% of the filings nationally. So if we went down this path, there's an opportunity to work really with all 50 states and, and uh, the District of Columbia and all the territories. Uh, and that sort of a blockchain, I would imagine, would be far more open. I mean, it is a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a public registry uh, where all of the information are public, all the data and all of the information are public records. So, Do you have a history of that? Is there, is there a precedent for um, getting other states on board with initiatives that Delaware has brought on and, and building that out? I would have to say no at this okay. point. <laughs> Maybe after today I'll be getting a lot of phone calls from, from my peers in other jurisdictions. Uh, I, I will say, I, I mentioned to someone last night at dinner that, <clears throat> uh, you know, we've been talking about this, as Marco said, for some time, but I, uh, my national association, which is the commercial administrators uh, in all 50 states, has a conference coming up, uh, and they just announced their agenda. And we have an international section of folks from, uh, from Europe who also participate in our conference. And it turns out that blockchain technology is on that agenda. Um, so I found that very interesting. I think it's coming from Europe, not from within the US. Uh, so obviously it's being, I, I don't think that would have appeared on our agenda unless uh, there were a number of European corporate registrars who must be thinking about this already or perhaps already using it. Uh, and if they're thinking about it, I'm sure the United States will be as well. That's interesting. Marco, uh, when I ask you about that, there's been a lot of comparisons between Europe and the U.S. And lately it seems like Europe is sort of taking a pole position. We want to talk about that? Yeah, so the, from, certainly from a regulatory perspective, which is where most of the law started in this area, the U.S. has been light years, light years ahead of Europe and most of the world. Now, you might not like where we've ended up. You might have, you know, you, 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 you might have qualms about the, for example, 50-state licensing for digital currency companies. But the, <coughs> but the team both on the federal level and among the states in the U.S. is far, far ahead of where Europe is today. But, like you've said, that's changed dramatically over the last few weeks. Two weeks ago, um, I was asked to uh, speak at a, at a round table at the European Parliament. These folks are just starting this conversation. It's a conversation that's been going on really since mid-2013 here uh, in the U.S. And now Europe is starting to pick this up. Um, there is a draft plan of action that's been put together by the European Commission uh, to include some virtual currencies. And they're looking also at blockchain technology generally in uh, the payments directive and the AML directive. Um, but I think what's interesting about Delaware is that this is not a regulatory story. This is not a question of prescriptive laws. This is a question of enabling statutes, and that's some of the work that we're doing at Pillsbury. We're working on proposed amendments to the Delaware corporate law, to the, to the Delaware commercial code. So, Everyone's talking about licensing and registration and the golly, is, is this stuff a security or does the, is this going to require a money services license? That's an important story and it's a, and it's, a been story that, it's a story that we've all been living since 2013. But I think the more important thing that's happening now is the commercial law story. How do we actually make this happen as a matter of commerce? How do we recognize final settlement in the context of the Uniform Commercial Code? These are the issues that, quite frankly, I think are more challenging than the regulatory issues. Mark, you seem to be agreeing uh, violently with that. Do you want to tell us? <laughs> violently, yes. What, what, the what, nodding what, dog. Yeah, what, what's, what do we need? And, and so obviously, Delaware is the first, the first step. Where do you see this going? Well, I get excited because I'm, I get quite wonkish about rules and regulations. I know that sounds strange. I come from a very long history of being regulated by the alphabet soup of every regulator. Um, and, and I think that when you have a very powerful technology and you can understand the regulatory landscape, you can get in front of it and, and really create a huge value proposition where some people may have thought it's restrictive, um, I see opportunities. And um, the state has been very forward thinking about how to address this. We believe there should be rules and regulations around this because uncertainty, if you ask the majority of the CEOs out here that have startups or are running operating businesses, 
what's the biggest issue? It's not regulation, it's uncertainty around regulation. Right? We just want to run our business in a way where we know we can be compliant. And the state of Delaware is a fantastic partner to say, we're there with you, we're going to help guide what is compliant and what is not. And from a technological perspective, you know, from you know, pitching our own book, we've designed our system to be compliant based on different use cases. So as we talked about different ledgers, the state's going to have really strong ideas about where things should go. And, uh, and then being able to partner with someone like Marco is the foresight to see what's happening all over the world. We can have best practices. So Matthew, you seem to be agreeing violently with Mark when he's talking about regulatory uncertainty. Well, yeah, I, I, to pick up on the governor's remarks again, I mean, he talks about our enabling approach to legislation. So I think that what we're striving to do here is to provide some certainty that uh, if we conclude it's advisable if the General Assembly and the governor determine that this is the path they want to take, we'll make it clear in our corporation law that distributed ledger shares are, are permissible. Uh, my expectation is that we won't have, a, as Marco describes, a very rigid framework in terms of detailing how you go about creating those types of shares. We'll probably have some sort of uh, large principle-based framework in terms of criteria that ought to be met, not detail-oriented, to allow for this approach to be taken. And, and if I can just say, sure. the, the reality may well be that that, that, uh, that these distributed ledger shares are already permissible under Delaware yeah. corporate law. In fact, it's like so many other things in Delaware corporate law. When, pe when we're approached with a new idea, we often say, well, of course it's allowed. But then the actual users and industry groups will say, well, can you bring some clarity to the statute right. so that we know that should we get in a dispute, uh, should we have a, uh, a you know, a, a dispute between managers and shareholders or among shareholders that when we get to court that the court won't you know ask the question whether this was permissible so uh, you know we, we've made a number of changes over the last you know really 40 years to try to when, when we're asked by industry groups uh, is this allowed you know can you expressly make it clear so right. that there's no uh, and and I think that <clears throat> realistically that people are going to be reluctant to do these distributed ledger shares until we bring that clarity. You know, lawyers know that one of the reasons that Delaware is such a prized uh, jurisdiction for corporate law is its chancery court. Uh, is it at all difficult or, or would you expect any challenges given that this is such a complicated area of technology or do you think the chancery court will understand what you're, what you're doing here? The Chancery Court judges are, are pretty sharp, uh, so I, I would imagine that they'll, they'll have no problem embracing this and, and getting their arms around it. Okay. Uh, Mark, I want to ask you about something else that the governor announced, which is that you are locating physically to the state of Delaware. I mean, so that's terrific. Why are you doing that, and why are you giving that up? Are you moving from where, from New York? No, we're, Symbian's headquarters won't be moving, but if you follow us in, in the media, we've, we have a joint venture uh, partnership with IPRIO, okay. specifically around syndicated loans. And as part of that, there's a, a back office group, um, an operating group, shall we call them. Since we do get rid of the Midland back office, I won't call them back office. Okay. <laughs> um, there's an operating group that exists today in North Carolina. Okay. And we'll be moving that operating group to Delaware. And, why'd you uh, choose and, and we're doing it to show our commitment to the state, as they've shown to us as well as because if we're going to be using different types of ledgers, and the Bitcoin blockchain is one of them, uh, we want to make sure we're in a state where we know that there won't be new rules and regs that come up that you know, prevent us from being able to operate our business. So it's an exciting place to be. We really want to eat our own dog food and, and show our strong partnership with Delaware, so we're happy to move there. Marco, do you think other companies might be moving to Delaware? I think so. Um, you know, part of, the, part of the vision that we've been... <coughs> that we've been discussing uh, is the development of a real tech hub in Delaware, which is not new. It's, it's something that has been sort of quietly underway for, for, for some time. I think Rick can probably uh, speak to this a little bit more closely, but um, there is uh, already a, an incubator and training center, right, in, uh, in Delaware? In yes. The, yeah. So, I mean, D Delaware has a population of about a million people. Uh, but 10% uh, of our private workforce works in financial services and corporate services. Uh, and, you know, they're great jobs, they're clean jobs, 
uh, and you know this governor under under his leadership has been working very hard to build uh, the sort of infrastructure that can support those those jobs. And if you look at uh, the growth of financial services in Delaware, which began in the 1980s with some financial regulatory reform. Uh, we're seeing a transformation in what those jobs are. I mean, those jobs, and you know, we're back office pushing paper and that kind of thing. And today, they're totally transforming into technology jobs. And you know, our our, our largest private sector employer is now J.P. Morgan Chase, and they just uh, are they're they're opening up a uh, three thousand person innovation center uh, in northern Wilmington, and every single job will be a technology job. So. Uh, the, the the migration of those services uh, has been tremendous, and we've been building the infrastructure both in our in our high schools. Actually, the governor could talk more about in more detail than I can, but there's a lot of work with our high schools and our and our middle schools, uh, and certainly with the University of Delaware and Delaware State University to to build that workforce that can continue to feed those the, the, those, those jobs. So. Marco, not to take the uh, focus off of Delaware, but I know that you've also been working with New Jersey uh, on different initiatives there. Do you want to give us an update on that and tell us how it's the same or different from you're doing in Delaware? Sure. Um, so just uh, by way of background, um, the New Jersey Economic Development Commerce uh, Committee in the state assembly came, uh, came to me and asked me to draft um, a, a new Bitcoin law. They, so they call it. It was a digital currency law. In fact, it uh, ended up being titled the uh, New Jersey uh, Digital Currency Jobs Creation Act, uh, and it uh, is a regime that is uh, sort of a mix of carrots and sticks. Economic incentives to, as a as a technology company, come into New Jersey and d d develop digital currency technology, um, and also carrot. Or that's the carrot, and also the sticks. Um, it was sort of in the wake of the New York bit license, which many of us are familiar with. It was a licensing regime. Um, the New Jersey regime was a registration regime, similar to what you have on the federal level. It says, look, bring in, bring in your business to New Jersey so that we can study it, so that we can learn from it, so that we as law enforcers and regulators can eventually, when it comes time to make new law, take a descriptive approach. We can describe what we've seen work and what we've seen not work in law. We can describe that in law. Um, and that's actually not all that dissimilar from the vision behind the, new, uh, behind the Delaware Initiative, which is uh, primarily that there, that, that there is no current intention to develop new prescriptive uh, regulations for digital currency companies, for virtual currency companies. There's, that's, that's not just a business-friendly kind of attitude. That is a deliberate decision on how to regulate, which is to learn from the industry. It's not delegating enforcement off to a self-regulatory or, or organization or sitting on your hands and doing nothing. It's being proactive to bring businesses into the state where you can monitor them, you can identify them, you can keep a tabs on who's, who's holding your citizens' money, who's holding their digital assets and securities. Make sure that those people don't get too far. But at the same time, observe, monitor, see what's working and what's not working so that when the time does come, we will have the information that we need to actually create those regulations. It's the same vision in, uh, in both projects. I believe it's a smart one. I believe it balances uh, consumer protection and encouraging innovation. I think, it's, I think it's the right way to go, and I think a lot of states can learn from what Delaware is doing here today. All right. We've got less than two minutes left. Any last thoughts, or what are the next steps uh, soon? So, well, I, I do want to talk a little bit about this, this, this initial pilot that we've done with, uh, with Symbian, which I think is really, really interesting. And I got an email. They, they were so quick, and I, I guess we sent you the uh, use case on Wednesday, and you had it up on Friday, which was really incredible. And our, our state archivist sent me an email uh, last night that just had one word. It said, wow. <laughs> uh, so if you want to Google uh, Steve Mars and look at his picture, you're going to see uh, a face of a kind of guy that doesn't get wowed too often. Uh, and uh, it, it really is incredible. And it's a great place to start, in my mind, looking at the public archives, because that's where these records ultimately end up. And so it's going to give us an opportunity to look at, but of course all of these records uh, originate 
um, often in the private sector right. and make their way into the public archives or make their way into a state agency, into a state agency's database and imaging systems, and then eventually into. Uh, so we're going to see what some of the best opportunities are uh, for a, many, many additional use cases. And ultimately, the question is going to become, you know, how do we originate those documents using a blockchain so that when they do get accessioned and arrive in the archives 30 years later, they're, they're just there. So we're very excited by it. And we want to particularly thank Mark and Marco for just incredible support that they've given us over the last uh, number of months on this. You made it easy, I tell you that. That's, uh, that's been <laughs> All right. Well, that's the last word. Yeah, just a, a final point. Look, I, it's, I think it's easy to overlook a lot of these announcements as, as things that happen at conferences. But the title of this conference is making, the subtitle is making blockchain real. There's so much talk and there's so much hype. There's, there's so many, quite frankly, um, technology folks at the companies and banks and financial institutions that we represent coming to the CEO, the general counsel, and saying, we put a security on a blockchain, we put a bond on a blockchain. And the GC says, well, that's nice, but how do we know that's actually going to be recognized in law? How do we know it's actually going to work? How do we know it's not just bits and bytes flying around the network? How do we know it's real? And that's the first step that we're taking today, is making it real. And I'll challenge all the CEOs and startups out there, find a Andrea, Talk to her about coming to Delaware. Follow us there. We think it's a fantastic place to be. All right, multiple last words. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the panel. <laughs>